I want to thank uh, David, thank the president for that fabulous introduction. It is a joy to be in his presence. As I said in the earlier lecture, um, here at Pittsburgh, as we used to say in the Baptist church, when the church calls a a really good pastor, you got a really good one. (laughs) He is a great president, and I am so excited that he is offering leadership from this strategically important institution. Once again, I want to thank you for the high honor of allowing me to be the Shaft Lecturer for this year. It is a great joy and thrill for me to be here. And once again, I want to uh, thank the President and thank the Dean and thank um, Director Blyer for her absolutely brilliant leadership. I have had a wonderful, wonderful time, and I am certainly learning, learning so much from the wonderful pastors here and also down in Youngstown, Ohio, and to be with the students. Oh my goodness, wonderful students. And to be with colleagues. Tomorrow I'm looking forward to spending some time with colleagues here at Pittsburgh and with being with students, and we will continue to plan the overthrow. (laughs) (laughs) The revolution is here. The revolution is here. Well, what I want to do this afternoon, uh, and I'm sorry I have so much technology in front of me. Um, I I, I have my laptop and my uh, iPad in case one runs out of juice. (laughs) Then I have the other one. (laughs) You know how these things work. Um, But what I want to do is to um, continue this exploration that we began in our first hour. The the first lecture was about how to draw lines, how to draw lines. And we spent some time talking about the significance of the line and the absolute urgent and crucial matter for us of thinking the line. We have to think the line. So now in this second lecture, I want to explore how to draw circles. Let's begin by stating the truth. Circles are beautiful. They speak so much to us, speak deep into our hearts, into our souls. They speak of cycle, of return, integrity, wholeness, coherence. Sometimes circles even speak of eternity. Drawing circles is one of the very first things we introduce children, we introduce children to in order to introduce them to their imagination and allow them to feel their creativity in drawing circles. Circles are like lines, basic and crucial to living life. Circles like lines are not just images or concepts in our heads. They are in the world and they form in us, connecting us to our worlds in very powerful ways. If lines teach us the limitations of our attention and concern, guiding us in thinking the inside and outside, the safe and the dangerous, the contained and the free, then circles do a collaborative work. Circles instruct us in movement, showing us the cycles and circuits, the cycles and circuits we traverse in daily life, home to school, to work, to home, home to work, to gym, to home, get paid, pay bills, save something maybe, Buy something, get paid, do it over again. Get children up, get them dressed, get them to school, pick them up, take them places, bring them home, feed them, help them with homework, bathe them, put them to bed, and then when the sun rises, repeat. (laughs) These are circles found in, these are circles found in 
um, circuits. Each aspect of the circuit has its own integrity, but its true meaning is only found in relation to other circuits that together show us the circle. Circles also instruct us in our patterns of belonging, families and friends. Outer circles for friends held loosely, inner circles for friends and families close to our hearts and minds, and then if we are blessed, we form those deepest circles, pulsating with the beat of our hearts, with those we want to share our intimate journey and joy, and to do so in repetition. Like the line instructs us, so does the circle but with even more power than the line. Indeed, the circle is more powerful than the line. If the line directs our energy, then the circle generates it. Its inertia always projects the hope of eternity. The circle says to us that this is the way it will always be, or at least into the foreseeable future. The circle joins us together in common doing, common doings, whether we wish it or not, and in common seeing, pressing us to accept our life in the circuits. But like the line, the circle has been transformed into something that encloses, conceals, and segregates. Our unholy trinity the one I introduced you to in the first lecture is also at the heart of the problem with the circle as it was with the line, as they were with the line. The merchant, the missionary, and the soldier took hold of the circle and transformed a creative possibility into a destructive reality. This, as I said earlier, is their shared power. They create through destroying, and they destroy through creating. What did they create, Dr. Jennings? I'm so glad you asked that a question. You asked a great question before, now you're asking yet another one. They created the races by means of the circle. They drew a circle where it had never existed around the body. This was part of the work of enclosure I spoke about earlier. Once you separate people from land and from all that speaks to them and speaks for them of who they are and why they are, then you make them vulnerable to a new optical power that constitutes identity solely in the seeing, in the perceiving of difference. The early Europeans who came to the new worlds, drew circles around peoples. Like a cookie dough cutter, encircling dough and separating it from its surroundings and thereby binding it into something new, something consumable. This metaphor metaphor fails, however, precisely at the sight of the dough. The spatial and bodily circle that they drew did not cut through, this, uh, cut through and around the same stuff, that is the same people. It cut through peoples, families, stories, ways of life, and brutally mashed together people vastly different, not into new peoples, but races. They also encircled their own body, but they formed whiteness, they formed whiteness as its governing circle. Whiteness emerged as a circle that encircles. Here's what we must understand. Race is encircled life. It is bodies detached from earth from land, from animal, and then sealed in phenotype, bodily characteristic, physical appearances, coupled to language, stories, histories, and practice. The merchant, the circle merchant, missionary, and soldier formed around the body matched the circle they formed around life itself. We must remember that every people live a circle. 
with circles inside of circles. Birth, growth, maturity, wisdom, death. Every people have a process of becoming, a process of becoming, becoming adult, becoming leader, entering one's calling, one's vocation, and all of this made visible by their circle. So the children become the young, then become the leaders of their people, then become the elders that guide, then become stories that are told. And then they join the eternal presence that covers and surrounds the people. For so many people of the world, that becoming I just described require the earth, the ground, water, sky. It required animals. It required days and seasons. Days and seasons with interesting texture to make them particular days and seasons. It required snow and rain, sun and heat, morning and evening, stones, lots of stones, mountains, trees, forests, streams, and rivers who speak, who sing, who yell, who scream, rivers. The circles they lived moved in and out of these things and more. Indeed, The circle cannot exist without these things. The circles they live depended on the earth. But if all these things and more are taken away, if land and animal, earth and sky, as they knew it, are taken away, how will they become? So many indigenous peoples asked that question and no one could understand, or should I say, very few people could understand what they were asking. How can they become, how can they enter into who they are? What will their circle mean? It was taken away from so many people. The land was turned into commodity and their bodies joined to the commodity chain. They were told your entire existence only makes sense inside one true circle. Production to consumption, back to production. Production to consumption, back to production, again and again. Every endeavor, every endeavor, all growth, all maturity and identity, Every destiny will only matter if it can be calibrated by and significant to the global markets formed at the hands of merchant, missionary, and soldier. From this demand for significance, for participation in a global circle, came the logic of the modern nation and the birth of a form of collective consciousness hungry to consume every people, every tongue, every tribe. Life in a nation will be life aimed at and shaped by this new circle from production to consumption to production again. That's that's the circle. That's the circle. Life in a nation is life in the new circle. People the world over were chained to a new emerging capitalist circle with the demand that they as a people or if they want as a nation that they must become useful to the circle itself. So now we exist in strange circles, my friends, drawn by race, aiming always to enclose us in every possible way, our ethnicities and genders, our religions and our sexualities, all enclosed in a racial belonging that will not yield. It has an energy, it has an energy that we give life to and we draw life from. And we move in between circles drawn by nations aiming always to define us, define for us our belonging and determine for us our futures. 
And we live and move and have our futures in the circle of the commodity chain, pressing us to turn everything, including our bodies, into reflexes of consumption and production. The deepest work, the deepest work, however, of strange circles, of our strange circles, the deepest work they do is to fit us for a segregation that is both inside us, working down to the bone, and outside us, shaping our spaces and places. You know, segregation, segregation is old. It is ancient, like the devil born of power and desire to control one's world. Some have argued, and strangely even argue now, that segregation is natural. People segregate, they announce. They form separate people groups shaped in story and land and animal and seasons and histories, histories of both victim and villain. And in the contingencies of time, they'll draw people together to create a tentative coherence of identity out of the chaos of its fragmentation. There's no argument here. People do separate. And even if we wish to make a fine distinction that some theorists want to make a fine distinction between separation and segregation, that's really beside the point. We must look at the history. We must look at the history, my friends. The blood-stained grounds of segregation's work. Segregation has always been the precursor to genocide. Always. Preparing the way to move from enclosure of a people to their strangulation. Capture them in space and kill them in time. Write that down, it's worth remembering. Capture them in space, and in your own good time, kill them. In our time, our strange circles conceal the horror, the sheer horror of segregation. They present segregation as a natural act, a benign action, sometimes unavoidable, sometimes necessary. We segregate now, Because we believe in it. We believe in segregation. Even people who would strongly tell me they do not, I must tell you the truth. You are lying to yourself. We believe in segregation. Down to our bone. We segregate spatially in our cities and in our towns our neighborhoods, and our buildings. And in so doing, we perpetuate inequalities, xenophobia, racism, and violence simply by how we form space. We tell ourselves that people segregate according to their preferences or even for their own good. The geography flows with the market and they have neither mind nor evil intent, we tell ourselves. But that is a lie. That's a serious lie. We, we segregate culturally, maintaining both obvious and subtle boundaries of language, of story, of practice, of homegrown wisdom, of religion, of history. We may live and interact with each other, but we maintain a psychic distance and a clear and palpable sense of the other as outsider. This is unfortunate. It is It is a missed opportunity, but it is real. And we segregate in desperation in fragments of time. We segregate in desperation in fragments of time. We run from the feel and force of assimilation, of being minority drowning in majority, of being black adrift in a sea of whiteness, of being the one the one immigrant, the one whose English isn't quite right, the one lost in the many. We seek out our own to remind us of who we are 
and help us push back against the images and ideas that render us deficient, unworthy of respect, ugly, dangerous, primitive, backward, shameful, hopeless. We seek solace in the company of our own people for whatever time we need to gather the fragments of unassimilated life to clothe ourselves afresh for our troubled journeys into a hostile world. This is a fact of survival, a badge of strength. But nonetheless, it is a tragedy. If I could just get people to speak honestly, it is a tragedy. What is should not be. Our circles create parallel lives, separate, unequal, and unequal. Our circles form in us segregationist mentalities that will accept the grotesque and normalize the brutal. But new circles can be drawn unlike the old because our creator has joined us in this world in circled flesh and encircling story with the power to do what none have ever done before to join. The joining is everything. It is everything. We Christians have always struggled to catch up to a God made flesh who has been way ahead of us in the social, far beyond us in framing of a life together that gives life and hope and peace. You know, think for a moment of the struggle shown in Acts 15. In Acts 15, it confronts us with the difference between Jew and Gentile and between the people of God and Gentile people. This difference is crucial because it illumines a God who creates all people and through the Spirit issues an invitation to life together. The difference between Israel and the Gentiles and the differences among Gentile peoples do not occasion God's anger, but God's delight. Because the creation's multiplicity and variety signal the mystery of the creature that God embraces as its creator. God has come for the Gentiles also. God has come for the Gentiles also. This is what Israel had to accept. This was unanticipated, unwanted. God wants them too. Israel's life reveals that their God is also the God of the Gentiles. But the point of this revelation was not merely sheer knowledge of God, but a shared life with God. The difference among peoples is the stage on which God will create a deeper and far richer reality of communion with the divine life. You see, Acts 15 brings us to the heart of the matter. It brings us to the interface of creaturely difference and divine desire where God exposes both toward each other in ways never before seen in Israel and among the Gentiles. God draws us without destroying us, without eradicating the differences among the creatures, Jews and Gentiles and Gentile peoples with each other, all born on the wings of God's desire toward life together in the spirit. The single greatest challenge for the disciples of Jesus is to imagine and then enact actual life together, life that interpenetrates, weaves together, and joins to the bone. This is our greatest single challenge. We have been unable to imagine and enact a life together that flows inside the subtleties and intricacies of people's differences, of such things as language, story, land, and animal. It has been easier to imagine either loss or resistance. Either loss or resistance. Loss of difference through assimilation or its control through conquest or resistance to that loss through active segregation 
How can people be joined together, truly joined together without loss, without the death of one people's ways for the sake of the other? This question's strength lay in our centuries-long inability to answer it. You see, a long time ago, we settled for what was gestured in Acts 15, at Acts 15, a form of segregation that allowed Gentile believers to go their way and for Jewish believers to leave them alone. Those, those are the exact words. Leave them alone. 1529. We have followed a segregationist trajectory and settled for a unity in the spirit that denies that the creaturely body is destined for communion, not only with God, but with each other. The fallacy too many people have accepted is that difference, that difference can only be maintained by some form of segregation. But Difference is best maintained, maintained in its life-giving realities through communion with others. Only in life shared, joined, exchanged, and desire of being made permanent can differences emerge in their deepest beauty as invitations to the expansion of life and love. The Gentiles learn of Israel's story, enter its prayer life, Learn its songs and in turn bring into Israel a world of difference that expands the contours of its life with God. And all of this through Jesus Christ, the giver of life. You see, it does not, it really does not matter. It really is not the point that I know my story, that I remember Mary and Ivory Jennings, who picked cotton in the South, made their way up during the Great Migration, passing Chicago, moving on up to Grand Rapids, and then carved a life, a life of love, a life to faith in the cold North. It it, it is not the point that I remember my story and tell my story. The point is that you know my story and that you tell my story. You make my story your own. You tell the story of Mary and Ivy, and I tell the story of your mother and your father. I make your story my own. I draw, I draw its genius into me. You draw the genius of my people into you. That's what Christians do. We don't do separate but equal story keeping. But the lie that we tell in church and the lie perpetrated in many seminaries is you are about separate but equal storytelling. That is crap. Sorry. We just have to say it what it is. Why? Of course, we understand. We live in the aftermath of modern colonialism and its intercourse with Christianity, which has robbed the church of the imaginative habit and the strong courage to embrace difference, knowing that through the process of embrace of its own creaturely life, Will, it will expand, it will expand, drawing it into more intense awareness of God, its creator. For too many people, for too many people, their sense of safety, comfort, and normalcy comes only in and through forms of segregation because they have never seen or felt anything otherwise. This is why segregation is so powerful, because it is the home of our sense of safety, the home of our sense of normalcy and of comfort. Segregated spaces are, for so many of us, the places where we see and know ourselves. This is especially the case for too many Christians. The seduction of segregation, however, hides the fact that such self-knowledge is facile and conceals our true calling to be joined to one another and then another. Self-knowledge and the knowledge of a people are quilt-like. Self-knowledge and the knowledge of of a people are always quilt-like. They are designed, listen very carefully, 
They are designed to be broken open and woven with other knowledges, patterned in and with peoples so that sight of each can be seen together with others in ways that illumine each in its majesty. Here in such shared knowledge, shared self-knowledge, fragmentation works life, not death. Indeed, it overcomes death and isolation. But what are these fragments and what does it mean to be broken open in this way? Is this a matter of violence, conquest, brutality? The breaking open is not an external action but an intimate one. Like the breaking of a loaf of bread and the sharing of a meal, the breaking open is when someone chooses to offer what is in them to other. These are the fragments of life, of memory, story, hope, dream, touch, laughter, tears, friendship, family, peace, joy. Admittedly, the breaking open and the fragments now exist for all of us under the melancholic conditions of the aftermath of colonialism, where too many peoples in this world have had and are yet having their cultural realities shattered by nations and multinational corporations who relentlessly commodify their remains, their foods, their animals, their land, their stories, their rituals, and even their body parts. Yet the way forward is not through resegregation, but through the breaking open of our lives of those who benefit greatly from the soul-killing operations of nation states and multinational corporations, and through joining those whose bodies and stories have been marked by an unanticipated and unwanted shattering that yet haunts them. A quilting of lives together is always possible no matter how profound the tearing. You see, the point is not, as I said, that I know my story, that I keep my memories and the struggles of my people fresh in my living, but that you do. The point is the joining. The point is the joining. My stories are not taken from me by you, but join to you and yours to me so that we remember together, we know together, and being schooled in the joining, we will toward, we will join, we will move toward the future together in new ways, forming a new, expanding circle. Segregation remains, remains powerful, powerfully seductive because it joins the aspirations of the rich and powerful to the aspirations of those of diaspora and exile. Segregation gives to both groups the illusion of a self-determination that will run from the present moment into the future. Yet segregation also promises a space of relief, rest, and safety where the secrets of a people may be spoken without shame and fear of retaliation. Life in cultural, economic, and social silos performed in multiple parallel lines, parallel lines is the inner logic of too many communities. And such configurations accepted by Christians confront the church with its deepest sin. It denies the power of the living spirit. Indeed, too many pastors, too many church leaders, have made themselves the high priest of segregationist ways. They have settled for the love of their own people instead of a love that creates a people. They have, they have out of the sheer need to be accepted, embraced, celebrated, refused the holy work of the people of God to accept to embrace, to celebrate others different from themselves. Too many pastors believe in a pastoral ministry that upholds the dignity and cultural integrity of their own people 
And they believe that that must come first in some strange hierarchy of ministerial tasks that would later, at some point in time, later on, open toward embracing other peoples. Of course, the time for fully embracing others never comes. Because it cannot in this distorted vision of pastoral ministry. These pastors and churches, church leaders have forgotten the basic truth of their faith and their calling. They serve the God of another people, a Jewish God bound to the people of Israel. Indeed, they eat this Jewish God's body and blood with great joy, with great joy. They belong to the multitude. They belong to the multitude. That includes their own people as well. They belong to a God who has filled them with the Holy Spirit and who has opened their lives toward that growing, swelling multitude, that growing, swelling circle. They belong to a God that draws them to draw new circles. You see, God sees better than we do the urgent needs of our own peoples. God understands more intimately and deeply than we do the need for advocacy and support for them. Yet God asks of us in our hearing and feeling and doing to sense a wider urgency that binds us together in shared hurt and pain, need and longing. God seeks to join the vulnerable together across boundaries that have taught them to see their vulnerability in isolation in separation from the others who cry out in need and live in hope. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a circle that encircles the cries of my people and the cries of other people that can be heard in the distance. You see, every word we speak as Christians belong to the multitude before it belongs to our own people. Every holy utterance aimed at our own people moves to them and through them to others waiting and willing and eager to hear that word. All that is necessary is for all of us to yield to the eager spirit who waits for us to see beyond a segregationist mind into the mind of Christ and hear a calling that cannot be contained, but only obeyed. So what must we do? Very simply, because I don't want to tax you too long, you have been listening to me drone on for quite a while. We have to challenge the strange circles in every way we can, beginning with the ground. Today, around the world and in this country, We are creating what some have called incarceral spaces. And incarceral spaces are the linchpin to establishing three kinds of spaces. There are market commerce spaces. There are tightly hierarchically controlled spaces of habitation. And then there are At the center, stabilizing the other two, are incarceral spaces. Incarceral spaces, Dr. Jennings, what are incarceral spaces? I'm so glad you asked me that. You see, incarceral spaces are spaces intended to be prisons before the prison. An incarceral space is a space being slowly strangled of physical options, and psychic hope. Few, if any, swimming pools. Few, if any, libraries. Few, if any, places to sit and think. Look at a flower, look at a tree, listen to a squirrel. Few, if any, places to talk, walk, and meet. Few, if any, lines that run from their center to other city centers. Few, if any, really workable sidewalks. And certainly few, if any, lines that run 
to subdivisions of the light beyond them. These incarceral spaces are increasingly occupied by people with money, pushing the poor and vulnerable to the edges of existence. And these incarceral spaces have one reality that moves effortlessly through them almost constantly, the police in carceral spaces. But now, here is what I want to leave you with. These are circles that are being drawn. But circles, listen very carefully, circles can be drawn while circles are being drawn. One more time. Circles can be drawn while circles are being drawn. We can draw circles by forming relationships, commitments, constant communications across lines that have been constructed to keep us apart. We can do this by following the Spirit of God into new places. I want to leave you with that very last story in the book of Acts. It's an amazing story. Paul, you know, Paul, you know, was a criminal. He was, um, he was in jail. He was in soft house arrest, let's call it. But in truth, he was in an incarceral space. He was under threat of death. He was under surveillance. He, his, mo his movement and motion was severely limited, and he was in a space shaped by fear. And as you know, in the at the end of the book of Acts, there are, two, there are two things that one is very tragic and one is, is not. The one that is very tragic but real is that Jews in Rome, Jewish people in Rome, came to talk with him about this Jesus thing. And he did his thing, and they looked at each other and they looked at him and said, this man is crazy. We are in Rome. We are in the most dangerous place you can be. They already think that we are seditious and hear you talking this stuff. You are crazy. And they got up and they walked out. But then there's the other thing in the last book of Acts, in the last story, and that is Paul in this incarceral space, under surveillance, with the threat of death around him, being watched, his future completely uncertain. Sound familiar, doesn't it? In this space, he created a radical reality of hospitality. He welcomed all who came to him. And that's how the book of Acts ends. It ends with a circle inside a circle. And I believe that second circle has the power to break the other circle. I hope we can do something like that as well. Thank you very much.